Grace and peace are yours through Jesus Christ, who in the gospel sets us free from the law to serve him in love. We begin our sermon this afternoon with prayer. Lord God, open our hearts through your word that we may know you, not as a God who simply puts demands upon us and asks us to do things that we are incapable of doing, but because you are a God who pardons us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray today. Amen. Well, it is election time, and it's time where we get into the groove of this very long, long campaign that's going, on, going to keep on going until the middle of October, which I think is a record or close to it. The candidates are out there, and they're out there every day proclaiming their message. And if you listen to what they're saying, pretty much all of them have the same message. And it boils down to one word, change, right? In fact, that's the slogan for a bunch of them. If you can imagine these politicians speaking their mind, one says, well, things aren't good enough, but if you vote for us, we'll bring you the change you want. To which the other candidate replies, we've done a lot, but we promise to work more change. I mean, that's pretty much what they're saying, isn't it? So on October 19th, Canadians will go to the polls and we will elect a, a, a government and then probably we won't be surprised if in two or three months we'll all be starting to wonder, boy, I wish we could get a change. Get a new government again because that's just how it works with politicians, right? Well, change is always happening. Not just in politics, but the world is a sea of change. Things are, so, are changing so quickly and so often that we even start to wonder, well, what about our faith? What about the Bible? Shouldn't that be changing as well with everything else that's changing? Shouldn't we consider upgrading it the way people will want to upgrade their iPhone when Apple unveils the new phone this week? Shouldn't we consider getting faith version 2.0 that will be a little bit better than what we have now? Some of you are already smiling because you realize that you know what, even though a lot of things change, it's actually good that one thing doesn't change. And that is the word of God, which we are considering today, and a command that God gives us in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses spoke to the people, that you know what, we shouldn't just change everything. The best things are the things that never change that change us. And this is how Moses puts it. Now, Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. This is one of those really clear passages in the Bible that very directly commands us not to change the word of God. Don't add, don't subtract, don't twist it around, just keep it as it is. And Moses was, was speaking this command to the people of Israel, as they were basically saying goodbye to him. So this is, in effect, his goodbye sermon. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is. For 40 years, the children of Israel had wandered in the desert in Egypt, from Egypt to the Promised Land, and now they're ready to cross over, but Moses isn't going to go along with them. So what does he say to them? He says, don't change what I have been teaching you. Don't change what God has been commanding you. Keep it as it is. As those of us who are sitting here, most of whom have a, a Lutheran background, we, we get that. 
We don't want to change God's word. And if you are already thinking that in your mind, good, good for you. We don't want to add or subtract or change the word of God. But we also have to admit that's not the way everyone thinks and that's not even the way we think. If God gave me a chance to go back in time, back to the days of the apostles, back to the days of when the Bible was written, I'd have a few changes to suggest to the way the Bible would be written. For example, I would really like to know when Jesus came out of the tomb and how on earth did he get past the stone? It'd be nice if that detail was in the Bible. I'd like that to be added. Hmm. I would prefer if there was a Bible passage in there that was really clear in saying that Mary is just another sinner, a normal person like me and like you, because there are millions of people today who worship her as God. That would make it clear, wouldn't it? And you know what? I'm not alone in thinking this. Martin Luther, he spoke and said, you know what? I wish the book of James wasn't in the Bible. Whoa, strong words. Why? Because some people misinterpret a few passages in that book. And if I could go back, I'd either take those passages out or ask God to change it so it's a little bit clearer. It would help a lot of people to understand what God is saying. I'm sure that you have questions too. Things you've wondered about that you wish were either in the Bible or weren't in the Bible because, well, we don't like what they say. But even though we might have those feelings at times, we still are willing to say, you know what, this isn't my word, this is God's word. We can respect it as such, and we don't want to add, we don't want to subtract from that word of God. At least, we pay lip service to it, as Jesus said in the gospel. But, even if you don't take a sharpie marker and cross out those verses you don't like out of your Bible or rip the page out entirely, it's still very easy to subtract from God's word. All you have to do is ignore it. Have you ever listened and noticed during campaigns like the one that's going on now that when reporters ask politicians very specific questions, they're very good at avoiding the question altogether, ignoring it? For example, the reporter says, Sir, what will your party do to address our country's growing national debt? To which our dear politician will reply, My opponents have wasted our country's resources and will raise taxes on the poor. But if you vote for me, we'll bring real change. He didn't answer the question, did he? And they're really good at doing that, ignoring the question and by ignoring it, leaving it off to the side. And that's all it takes to subtract from God's word, isn't it? Simply ignore what it says. Pretend that it's not there. Instead of subtracting or ignoring God's word, Moses offers us this very simple command. He says, observe them carefully. We'll see this in just a second. Observe these commands carefully. Or perhaps I actually like the way the old King James says this better. It says, keep therefore and do them. In order to keep them, we also have to do them. You see, when you are doing what God commands, you're not ignoring it, are you? You're following it with all of your heart. You're keeping these commands and practicing them and not just leaving them on a coffee table collecting dust. But this is not the only command Moses gave us. He also says, do not add to the scriptures. Do not insert your own ideas. There is a series, a TV series, that I, I saw a few months ago back in winter about the national park system and the idea of creating national parks. And fascinating, the most fascinating part of that story was about a man named John Muir. Some of you may have heard of him before. He lived in the 1800s, and uh, he went to a place, a beautiful place called Yosemite. In the 1870s, when John Muir was just working in Yosemite, he noticed how 
Quickly, it was becoming commercialized. People were putting up hotels and shacks all over the place, trying to make a quick buck, but ruining the beauty of that wonderful place. And so he set about a, his lifelong goal was just to preserve it, keep it as it is, because when you add to it, when you put up these buildings and structures, you're actually destroying for the generations to come this beautiful place. Thankfully, he succeeded so that if you go there today, it still looks pretty much like it did when John Muir was there over 100 years ago. But if he hadn't, it'd be gone. In a sense, this is what Moses is saying. When we add to Scripture, we're actually subtracting from it. We're creating rules, basically, ideas that we think everyone should follow, which, like the Pharisees, lead you away from God's Word. That if I just wash some bowls and kettles and wash my hands, as we heard, that means that I'm spiritually clean. Unfortunately, our sin remains. It doesn't work when we add to the Bible. And if you've ever noticed in campaigns, politicians, when they talk about change, usually what they're talking about is changing laws, changing rules, forcing organizations and people to carry out changes. But they never really address us. They never ask us really to change. How would that sound if a politician's campaign slogan went something like this guy? The problem with Canada today is you. The Canadian people are selfish. You are greedy. You are lazy. You are the ones who need to change. How many votes would that guy get? This is what happens when we add to God's word. We distract off of the real message that God's law and gospel are pointing right at our hearts, telling us that the problem is in fact us. But we can't be the ones to work change. Only God can do that. And that is why Moses is bringing this message so faithfully to the Israelites today. As he's going to continue on in this very next chapter to share with them the, this, the Ten Commandments, you've heard of them before perhaps. They haven't changed, have they? They're still the same commandments that God asks us to follow today. Written in our consciences, written in his word. Not to show us how to earn heaven, but to show us that we cannot change ourselves enough to earn what God wants to give us. Let's read what Moses says. Observe them, these commands, carefully. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? So in this sea of constant change, God is giving to his people, he's giving them a law that won't change. A law that will be so different from the others that people will actually say, this people, the people of Israel, they're blessed. Well, how on earth can that be? What makes their set of rules better than the set of rules that other nations had? That's a good question, isn't it? God's law is different than the laws that we get from our politicians or that we get from governments and those who set rules over us to try to tell us you have to follow these to earn something, to get something, not to get in trouble. But God's law is different. Because mixed in with the law, even the law that you find in a place like Deuteronomy are promises. Promises that God is showing that he is not so distant from us the way that our politicians are. Have you ever tried to talk to them? Maybe write them a letter? It's pretty rare that they'll take your letter and call you up, isn't it? 
It's pretty unusual if they would sit down with you one-on-one -on -one for coffee and say, what do you think about how the country is going? But God does. He cares about the people of Israel so much that he chose them out of all the nations of the world and said, I want to make you my own. I want to set you free from slavery. I want to bring you by miracles, through signs, through the Red Sea, to the promised land. I want to choose you and be near to you the way that God was near to them with that pillar of smoke that guided them by day and a pillar of fire that guided them by night. And so he also wants to be near to us. To call us to be his own. Not to just give us a set of rules that we have to follow. A set of hoops that we must jump through in order to get his attention. But to speak to our hearts. You get this. Because you understand that if you want to actually change yourself, you can't do it. If you set out on a plan to do a whole bunch of good things and, and really make yourself into a better person, maybe you can do it for a few days, a few weeks, but it's extremely hard to change your heart just by following rules, isn't it? In fact, it's impossible. But we see that God is the one who comes down to bring change. He is the one who said, I love you, I love my people so much that I am going to change myself in order to love you, in order to make your eternal happiness my highest good. So God did. He changed himself by becoming one of us. By sending Jesus into the world. Not just a little baby who looks cute, but actually the Son of God. That he might follow every single one of his laws that he gives here in this book of Deuteronomy perfectly for you. That he might wash you clean and change your heart by what he does giving his life on a cross. That he might change your eternal destiny by rising from the dead on the third day. This is the kind of change that God was willing to do. And for that, I suppose we could say that he has a pretty good track record to run on. If, he was, if God was running in the campaign against the others who want your vote, his track record is pretty spotless. Every promise he's made kept perfectly. Every prophecy that he foretold what would happen, it did. And so when he says, I forgive your sins through my son Jesus Christ, you can be sure that he has worked that change in you through Jesus. So if this is the way God is, why would we want him to change? Why would we want to change his word? Why would we want to update it and make it more modern the way some think we should? See, the very fact that God's word doesn't change, that it never changes, is the very reason why it actually begins to work change inside of us. Because everything in our lives is constantly changing day in and day out as we grow older and as we live in the world that itself is changing. But God doesn't. And his word doesn't. And his promises don't change. This week, Canadians all over were moved by a picture of a little boy one of the Syrian refugees who drowned on his way seeking refuge in Turkey. And if you saw the picture, you know exactly what I'm talking about, how deeply that changed people's hearts. Before that picture came out, people talked about refugees and people debated policy. 
but it was a picture that moved the hearts of millions of people to change the way they think about refugees. Could you imagine how our hearts would be changed, how we ourselves would be changed if we could see a picture of what Jesus looked like giving his life for you and for me on the cross? Could you imagine how the world would be changed if they could see the way they saw that little boy? A different picture of his tomb empty and our risen Lord welcoming us with his arms open wide. It changes everything by the very fact that the word of God itself doesn't change. See, God works that change in us. And then he allows us in a a sea of constant change to fall back on this rock that is the word of God. In the midst of this sea that, that never ends, there it is, this rock that we can hold on to knowing that God will never ever change his promises that he's given us. And when we cling to that, then we ourselves are more than willing to follow, to live for him, and to live a life that is changed by what God has done in us. Amen.